Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to People in Pain Network's uh, webinar today with Comox Valley, Dr. Serena Patterson, about 10 steps to living with chronic pain. I'm Heather Devine, I'm the CEO of People in Pain Network, and I'm leader of a few of our pain self-management groups here on Vancouver Island. I will just take a moment to quickly review webinar etiquette for people who may not be as familiar with them as others. The webinar today will be on listen-only mode because we have up to 200 people who have signed up for this webinar. There will be a question and answer period at the end and I will moderate the questions for Dr. Patterson. On your control panel there is a box that says questions and please type your questions in there so I will be able to read them. If we do not get to your question because of time, please enter it on your evaluations that you will um, see. There's a box for questions that you would like to still be answered and I will make sure that Dr. Patterson gets your question and uh, she will reply as she can. Um, we are a registered nonprofit organization and our main focus is to establish peer-led pain self-management support groups for people living with pain and their families. We are also a good source of education materials, recorded webinars, presentation, YouTubes, and videos by internationally known experts in the field of pain, pain management, and pain self-management. We have links to other organizations who are also doing good work in the field of pain. Currently, we have 22 groups in BC and one in Alberta. And if you would like to have a group in your community, we just need to identify peer leaders who are interested in leading this group and we will help you get one started. For information about our groups and the resources on our website, please go to pipain.com, peopleinpain.com. This webinar will be recorded today and the link will be available on our website and Dr. Patterson's website. And I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Patterson. Serena Patterson is a clinical psychologist in private practice at Grunberg Patterson Center for Counseling and Assessment in Comox, BC. Dr. Patterson taught human development, psychopathology, psychology of women's and women's studies at North Island College from 1991 to 2011 when she left teaching to better accommodate her own pain conditions and to focus on private practice. Her practice includes veterans, and other survivors of traumatic events and everyday hardships. She notices that many patients do not disclose physical pain unless explicitly asked and then may not be reliable self-reporters. Her approach to working with pain is informed by those reluctant patients by her own experiences of living with chronic pain for three decades and by her extensive reading in the field of pain theory, assessment and treatment. She draws from a, a eclectic mix of influences including cognitive behavioral, acceptance and commitment, attachment focused, narrative, client focused and existential therapies. Dr. Patterson's treatment focuses on the quality of life. This is Dr. Patterson's first time presenting with us so please welcome us and please join me in welcoming Dr. Patterson to our webinar today. I think my biggest fear about living with chronic pain has always been that it would make me into a grumpy person. Um, I don't know if anybody out there shares that. I've come to the conclusion that pain definitely changes us. Pain, I think, is like a fire that refines and, and simplifies our life and may make old patterns stronger. So when we think about how pain, when I think about how pain is going to change me, I think about uh, pe all the people that I've known over the years who have pain, and I know that some of them become very, very generous in spirit, very forgiving of life's imperfections, very embracing of life. Some become grateful and appreciative as they live uh, with their pain. So pain can temper us into self-centered or generous, resentful or forgiving, uh, grasping or grateful, critical or appreciative of the efforts people make to help us feel better. And how we live with our pain, going one direction or the other, is a matter of the conscious practice 
that we use every day. Living with pain, I think, becomes um, a path for us, a path to uh, becoming more ourselves and hopefully more the self that we want to be. I've noticed when I'm, when I'm out, when I'm around, when people walk in my office, I see the little giveaways that tell me this is one of my own people. This is one of, this is one of my pain tribe. It might be that they can't quite sit still without moving around. Uh, it might be a stiffness when they get out of a chair. It might be a little bit of a wince. It might be a little bit of, of uh, indication of pain in the eyes. But we are a, uh, the people who walk in pain, I've begun to think of us as this, this great invisible tribe out there who often don't recognize each other but uh, because we're hiding. Um, but we are numerous. We, uh, <laughs> it's very difficult to come out as a person with pain. It's difficult to, to reveal yourself because we're often misunderstood. Uh, we walk with pain as a burden. Um, it can make us grumpy. Uh, it can make us compassionate. Um, as with any disability, pain changes the way we have to do things. It gets in the way of the, what we think of as normal. Right? We can, if our pain is, is small or mild, we can pass as normal, and that's not a bad strategy. Um, in fact, that's a very good strategy for mild pain to, to ignore it, pass as normal, but as our pain increases to the moderate level or the severe level, um, we may look normal, people may say, you look great, uh, and yet we have had to make adjustments in our expectations of life. And the moment we start making adjustments in our expectations of life and how we do things, we go off the well-beaten path. We have to start creating ways to do it ourselves. The bad news is we have to make it up as we go along. And the good news is we get to make it up as we go along. So pain, like any disability, I've come to think of as living with pain is an art form. You're making it up, you're creating it as you go, and that's um, sometimes a pain in the butt, but it's also sometimes really exciting. So I've developed a 10-step program for, for working with pain, and I, I confess you are my debut audience, so I'm really excited about your feedback today. I'm really excited about your participation and you being out there. Um, this, is, this is the debut of, of my program. Step one is about shame. It's about dropping the shame. When people come into my office, um, at least nine out of ten of them present right away with embarrassment, uh, present right away with, um, with a lot of internalized shame that their pain is somehow a failure. Why, why should we feel guilty about pain? This is an interesting question. It's not a, a moral issue. It's not a character deficit. It's not a failure, and yet somehow we feel like it is sometimes. How does this happen? Um, we live in a very pain-phobic society. We live in a society that uh, doesn't like to talk about pain, doesn't like to acknowledge pain. Um, when we have pain, we're told to take something, let it go away. What's the language of pain shaming? You're probably familiar with it. These words, are they familiar to you? You're a whiner. Oh, poor muffin. My heart bleeds for you. And my favorite, and the favorite of every, every veteran I've ever worked with, suck it up, buttercup, uh, is, is, is a nasty phrase. It's a phrase that, that says, you are weak if you complain. You are, you are complaining if you speak your truth. And that complaining is wrong, it's weak, it's, it's bad. And if you are weak, you are bad. Um, think of how we, we tell people 
when you confuse the word healthy with good. You say, well, that's, that's a healthy way to do something, or that's not a healthy way of coping, when what we mean is we approve or we don't approve. This is subtle but very powerful language of, sh of pain shaming. If I'm doing well with something, I would like to be told I'm doing well. Uh, if I am, uh, if I'm looking good, I'd like to be told I'm looking good. Um, I think confusing that with health creates, it uh, feeds into our, our language of pain shaming, our language that if you are in pain, there's something wrong with you, not only with your body, but you, with you as a person. These are, these, these are bullying phrases. This is, um, this is just another form of bigotry, and it's okay to stand up to it. I put this picture of the, of the otter here because I have, I have a rule, and that is never speak to your body in a way that you wouldn't speak to that baby otter, whose name is Petunia. And if you follow that rule, we find that we're practicing kindness on the inside which is a good place to practice it for a whole bunch of reasons that I hope will become more obvious as we go. You know, the part of us, when I think about my body self and your body self, the part of us that speaks through our body, speaks through our pain, is always, always very young. It's always, it thinks like a child. It, it, it feels like a child. So when we talk to ourselves, not only do we not do follow the not only do we need to follow the otter rule, but we also need to remind ourselves to stand with pride. Living with pain is hard. It's it's not easy. It's not for wimps. It's challenging, it's creative. It takes a lot of courage sometimes to get up in the morning, so hold your head up and walk or sit or stand or roll with pride. Step two is to grieve what we've lost. People with chronic pain have a lot of losses. Um, the association of poverty with pain is very strong. We lose uh, treasured jobs with new sources of income. We lose money on treatments that are beyond what our health care covers. We lose beloved activities. We even lose relationships. The rate of marital breakup with chronic pain is, is, is very high. Uh, friends sometimes drop away when you can't do the old things you used to do or when they just don't want to hear that you're in pain. Grief is, we need to talk a little bit more about grief. Like pain, grief is something we don't talk about enough in our culture. Um, I guess because grief is a form of pain and uh, we live in a culture and a time that distracts itself from pain. Right? We live in a TV time, an internet time, a, a time where we have really good anesthetic uh, medication, we're good at numbing ourselves, we're good at distracting ourselves, and we're losing a knowledge base uh, that we need to recognize grief, to deal with grief, to deal with pain. There's a skill set here. Um, so I'm going to start with, with how we recognize grief. It's a full body event. It has physical, emotional, and cognitive symptoms. Physically, grief can feel a lot like the flu. Um, our aches, our pains are magnified. Um, nausea is often a part of grief, especially the early stages of grief. Changes in appetite. Sometimes we don't want to eat when we're feeling grief. Sometimes we want to eat a lot when we're, feel when we're feeling grief. Sleep disturbances. Again, sometimes we can't sleep when we want to. Sometimes we sleep a lot with grieving. Um, one physical symptom that is almost a giveaway with grief is sighing. Um, grief, uh, sighing is very, very prevalent in grief. And mm, it, it's just, it's, 
it's fair, fairly specific to grief. When we're happy, we tend not to sigh. Um, when things, when we're content, we might have little sighs, little contentment sighs, but not the <sighs> that you see with grief, right? Emotional symptoms, of course, there's sadness. We knew that. There's also tearfulness. The tears can rest just close to the surface for for hours, days, weeks, even months with grief. Um, we may find ourselves crying at the drop of a hat, as you say, crying over com television commercials, crying over over um, uh, posts on our Facebook, crying over uh, a good book. Um, I hate it when I cry reading because then I can't read. Um, uh, crying when you're lying down, I hate that too because then you know you, you get stuffed up and you can't breathe. So tearfulness is is uh, a symptom of grief. And not only when we're sad, but just anything that moves us may, may bring those tears out. Anger is a, a normal emotional symptom of grief. Anger, irritability. Um, uh, sometimes our anger has a, 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 has a target. Sometimes it doesn't. Numbness is feeling like you're not feeling feeling apart from your emotions, and poignancy, that's a word that might be new to some of you, that just means that every emotion in the spectrum is turned up high. So not only do we feel our sadness and our loss, but we also, when grieving, may feel very intense emotions of gratitude, of joy, of humor, of... Um, of anger, of longing, of longing for um, for justice, for fairness, of uh, being moved by the beauty of the world, what, what I call the heartbreaking beauty of the world. Um, so poignancy. Cognitive symptoms are preoccupation. This is probably the most well-known cognitive symptom of grief, where you can't stop thinking about what you've lost all roads lead to that beloved job you miss so much, or all roads lead to the loved one who has who has walked out the door. All roads in your mind lead to the loss. Um, less recognized is the absent-mindedness, forgetfulness, poor concentration, difficulty learning new things, difficulty reading from one end of a page from the beginning to the end of a page in a book. These are cognitive symptoms of grief. So when we are grieving, we can feel like we've suddenly become very stupid. And it's important to know that that's a symptom of grief. And as grief passes, that is likely to pass too. How do we know whether it's grief or depression? This is a really important distinction to know. Both hurt, but grief has a different rhythm to it. Grief comes in waves with breaks in between. The, the overall timeline is variable. You might grieve for a week, a month, a year, longer than a year. You may grieve for the rest of your life for something that was very, very precious to you or you lost in a, in a traumatic way. But the waves of grief that hit you in the stomach, that make you cry, that make you want to curl up, make you want to go to your room and be alone, those grow farther apart and less intense with time. And in between the waves of grief, we get laughter, we get play, we get a t you know, time to, to go on with life. Um, waves last for a period of time that doesn't, doesn't exceed our physical capacity to cry and uh, to curl up and cry. Crying relieves the physical tension of grief, and it helps to shed stress hormones. Laughter does as well. Um, I'm, what I said about poignancy hits here too, that we, we, we cry more, we may laugh more when we're grieving as well. Giggles at funerals are absolutely normal. Um, grief, the, the, the waves and the rhythm of grief and the, the, the crying of grief, the physicality of grief, um, gradually seems to kind of clear a room inside of ourselves for new hopes and dreams and pleasures to grow. So there is a sense that grief is emptying something out. 
Um, in acute grief, we often say, I feel empty or I feel a hole in myself. And that's actually not an unhealthy thing to feel when, when you're grieving. It's like the emptying of a canvas for something eventually to be, to, be, to be painted on it. Depression, in contrast, drags on without that relief of tears or waves. Depression is flat. Grief is wavy. Depression includes feelings of helplessness, hopelessness, or self-loathing. Grief doesn't necessarily involve any of those. Right? We can grieve what we've lost and not feel guilty. We can grieve what we've lost and know that, there, that life will be good again or that we have the capacity to make life good again with time. Um, we can, conversely, we can have hope and we can have a sense of our own power and we can resist guilt and self-loathing and it's not going to get us out of grieving. We're still going to have those waves. We're still going to have those tears. So grief and depression part ways there. Depression, uh, when we grieve, we're at high risk, of course, for moving into depression. And if we are in depression, we need a more intensive intervention to restore hope. If we are grieving, we need comfort. What does grief first aid include? Uh, how, do you, how do you treat grief? Identify sources of comfort. Connect with the spiritual base. Um, and cry freely, cry from deep down in your, in your chest or in your stomach, and laugh freely from deep down as well. So grief first aid varies a little bit from person to person, but generally it means not being alone. Um, it means uh, being, being, knowing that you are loved, connecting with, with your source of love, and also uh, if you have a way that you connect with with the divine or with with something beyond this this life as we see it and walk through it every day that's your spirituality and um, that is for most people the place where grief throws us this by the way is me connecting with my favorite source of comfort and and spiritual solace uh, which is the gospel of puppy love. Step three is to shake hands with pain, uh, to get to know pain as experience. In step three, I'm not really talking about the physiology of pain yet. I'm talking about the experience of pain. There are two basic orientations to pain. We can, we can draw away from it or we can look closely at it. We can approach it with curiosity, with a desire to accommodate it, to understand it, or we can look at it as something exotic, something that doesn't belong in our life that should be banished. Banishment of pain is a false promise. There are risks to believing that the end of pain is our, is our goal here. Okay? And I, I want to emphasize that the banishment approach to pain, I think, is our dominant cultural discourse about pain. It's our dominant cultural model. If you have pain, well, take something. Get rid of the pain. And um, when I go to the bookstore, the, the, the self-help section is full of books with names like The End of Pain or um, uh, Get Rid of Your Pain or Stop the Pain. Um, the, you know, we are, we are over-promised. I think that pain will disappear if we do the right things, if we take the right meds, do the right exercises, follow the right regime, eat the right foods, right? Um, and that overpromise that we'll have an end of pain sets us up. First of all, it sets us up as individuals to ignore the changes in our lives that we need to make. If we don't adjust our expectations of our life, if we don't adjust either what we hope to do or the way we're going to do it in response to our pain, then we're at risk for over-medicating ourselves to make up the gap between what 
we can do in the bodies we've got and what we think we ought to be doing. Right? Over-medication, addiction, burnout, and self-blame are the individual risks uh, that, that uh, the banishment of pain um, approach sets us up for. Looking a little broader, as a society, we run the risk of, of being crueler to each other by believing in the banishment of pain. If we believe that pain is not something that belongs in life, it is not something that should be part of the human experience, then we stigmatize and build negative stereotypes of people who can't get away from pain. The pain people are seen as failures. We justify discrimination against people in pain. We create unnecessary hardships for pain people by failing to, pro to provide common sense accommodations, you know, small things like, like a bench to rest halfway through a, a, a trail, uh, like a place to sit in the grocery store for a little while. Um, small things like, mm, like kindness, just, just a kind word when someone is showing pain behaviors in public, um, the offering of a chair. Um, even the offering of the seat on the bus. Uh, if, we, if we are growing up, if a child is growing up thinking that pain doesn't belong in their world and that people who have pain, there's something wrong with them, they're not going to be polite. They're not going to be kind when people are having pain. And that's, that creates unnecessary hardship and isolation. And third, as a society, there is a collective wisdom and knowledge about living with pain and living with disability. There's a collective wisdom and knowledge about how to be compassionate, how to enact care, what people need when they're grieving or hurting, what we need when we're grieving or hurting, when to, uh, when to take a little break and, and, and have a snack and lie down, um, when to, um, why go for walks, you know what? All of this, when to go for a walk, when not to go for a walk, this knowledge and wisdom about pain is collectively held and passed, often from mother to daughter, it's often the realm of females, um, sometimes from neighbor to neighbor. But if we think that pain does not belong in the world, that pain shouldn't be part of the human experience, and we try to hide that pain, we banish it, we lose this collective knowledge. We fail to teach it to our children. We fail to teach it to one another. And we fail to value it in the professionals and the non-professionals who provide that care every day and keep the world going through their kindness. I don't think it's always been this way. I think that uh, particularly in the 20th century, our advances in medicine and especially in the widely available uh, medications for pain relief, beginning with aspirin and, um, uh, and developing um, standardized doses of, dosages of opiates for pain relief, um, and the huge growth of the pharmaceutical industry around pain, um, has been part of our cultural distancing from pain, our cultural um, moving toward that denial of pain uh, part. But if we look back, go back a hundred years or more, we find that every religious tradition deals with pain. You know, arguably every religious tradition is there because of pain. It's our uh, faith traditions and our community traditions that tell us how to mourn, how to come around people who are hurting, who tell, that tell us what taught us what compassion looked like. Also, those traditions once taught us what virtuous suffering looked like. What was a good way to, be, to, 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 um, to live in pain? Um, they gave us ideas that sometimes pain could be um, a sign of how much we cared about something. 
pain as, you know, we, we don't like the word martyrdom anymore. But martyrdom was not so many years ago held up as proof of a person's devotion to, to family or to God or to their society. Sacrifice um, is, is in many traditions a, a noble thing. Uh, transcending pain is uh, something that, that religious traditions uh, uh, have addressed. And the, uh, the idea, I love these words, of offering it up. I'm not sure where I, where I borrow that phrase from, but it, deep, in my, deep in my past somewhere, there is this phrase of offering up your pain to, uh, to God or to, to the divine. Um, so uh, every spiritual path that every, every organized religion and most disorganized ones as well have some place where they talk directly about pain and compassion. This was worth a slide of its own. Uh, this is, I was kind of blown away by this picture. It's from a Buddhist temple painting. Prince Siddhartha, who is the young Buddha, confronts the noble truth. And what is the noble truth? Suffering, old age, sickness, and death. That is the noble truth. That is the heart of, of, of Buddhism. Um, and I think that's really astounding. This is uh, another place to find to find language of pain and other you know and, and to find proof that pain is part of our human experience and it's always been with us. To find inspiration of how other people at other times have talked about pain is through art. Uh, Frida Kahlo is uh, I think my favorite pain artist. I, I, I can never forget. Uh, the, the painting on your left of uh, the self-portrait of Frida Kaho and her back pain. Uh, this is called The Broken Column. Uh, she had, her, her spine was broken as a very young woman in a car accident, so she had she was a very beautiful, uh, passionate young woman who had pain almost all of her life, all of her adult life. Um, if you look closely at this picture, you'll see she's stuck with pins all over her body. And the, uh, what, the, the column, which is her spinal column, is broken, you know. And yet, and yet, I look at her shoulders and they're broad and strong. And her gaze is direct. And she is fearless. Um, I love the unapologetic look in her face. Um, she is, there's no shame in that face. Her pain just isn't is. There's no crouching, there's no, uh, no victimization, there's no, there's just a woman who is beautiful in her endurance and in her pride of self. I love that picture very, very much. The other one is by the same artist, Frida Kaho, and it shows me a different thing that I know about pain, and that is um, that sometimes, in the midst of my pain, uh, I can I can dissolve the boundaries of my body and, and and feel like I'm one with the earth. And in joining with something more than myself, I get I get relief and I get I guess a transcendence of of pain. Pain that is shared, pain that is uh, you know, pain is something that that, that, that generally I, I keep one keeps within one's body. It's considered an individual thing. Pain is a very individual affliction, but pain, uh, uh, if we are able to get out of our individual skin, if we are able to remember that we are part of something greater, then that is one rather beautiful way of transcending pain. Here's another artistic representation uh, set of representations of pain that I found very moving. This is from a group of masks created by, by U.S. veterans of war. Um, this was an article in National Geographic last year. Uh, the veterans were in an art therapy program and they painted their pain and wore it on their faces. These two masks I like in particular, they're not 
I like them because they have they have a a grace to them and a beauty to them um, in their and yet they are honest. They're not they're not they're not cute cuddly kittens, but they're they're but they're unapologetic and honest about pain. They by my being drawn to rather than away from pain, uh, drawn to understanding it, drawn to having conversation with it, drawn to where it brings me. You know, uh, pain. I often say pain brings us to our knees, um, and that is spiritually that's a good place to be. Uh, living with pain is is very much for me a spiritual path, and this is. Uh, one of my favorite quotes again from Leonard Cohen, uh, ring the bells that still can ring, forget your perfect offering. There's a crack in everything and that's that's how the light gets in. Step four. Developing a language about pain. Um, you were sent, I think, before the, the seminar, a copy of my Patterson Grounded Pain Scale, if you have that with you. If you don't have that with you, you can, you can uh, get it uh, from, the, from the organizers. Um, I, developed, I, I developed the Patterson Grounded Pain Scale um, because the problem I, I had, and, and, and many people have, with the usual um, rate your pain on a scale of 1 to 10 is the the panic slash denial problem. The, 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 the cycle of panic and denial, it goes like this. How's your pain? Oh, it's not bad. It's about a 2. How is it now? Oh, it's about a 2. How is it now? It's 2, 2, 2, 2. How's your pain this week? It's a 2. How's your pain this week? You know what? I don't know why anybody's not paying attention to my pain. It's horrible. It's twelve. It's it's. I'm I'm dying, and no one knows. It's I'm 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 frantic. Uh, I I can't believe I've been in pain this long. Right? <laughs> How's your pain this week? Oh, it's, it's okay. I I I lost it. It's really just a two. You know. <laughs> and so this 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 back and forth. It's a two. It's a twelve. It's a two. It's a twelve. And really, really, most of the time our pain is in between, and it does range quite a bit in between. But in order to get an accurate view of it, um, we need those in-between numbers. And we need to be able to ground it, ground our rating with things that we can actually see. And we can actually notice about how we're managing, how our body feels, um, uh, and, and also to ground it to, so grounding it to things that are observable, and grounding it to, um, to signs of what we need to do at that point. So I organized the grounded pain scale and I'm going to give you just a really, really quick view of it today because I'm going to have, I hope you'll come back, uh, another webinar just on the grounded pain scale and using it. Um, it's, it's a really useful tool. So uh, the first tipping point of the scale is, is one, of course under one you don't have any pain. Um, but between one and three, if you're going to notice your pain, you usually have to kind of stop and notice it. You have to say, oh yeah, it's there if I listen for it. Three is the tipping point where you don't have to stop to notice it. It's there, you do notice it, it's in your consciousness. But if you effort, effortfully push it away, if you if you ignore it, which takes effort, you can. You can concentrate on other things, you can still do most of the things you do. But you're diverting a little effort into ignoring the pain. Pain is like a rock in your shoe. You can keep walking, uh, but it takes, takes something away to, to, uh, to ignore that. And you can only do it for a limited amount of time. So between three and five, what we notice lose what we lose is stamina right we don't lose performance in the moment but we lose how long we can do it five is the next tipping point because at five we're not only losing stamina we're losing performance quality 
we're losing concentration, we're starting to make mistakes, it's starting to interfere. I have to concentrate harder to just do the things I ordinarily do. When pain gets to five, that's a really good time to take a break. You know, uh, one of the things I work with is to try to help people know when they're getting toward a five because if you can start your pain management strategies just before five, then you can spare yourself quite a bit of, 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 uh, of trouble, <laughs> of mistakes, of uh, having to, to turn back pain that's already run away, that kind of thing. At seven, the pain is the dominant thing in your experience. It's the main thing happening. It's the main thing you're able to think about. So um, I, I like to think before seven, Pain is like this increasingly big thing you carry. But after seven, pain is like the room you're in. It's dominating, it's, it's, it's like this room you can't get out of, you can't leave. And trying to have conversations, especially difficult conversations at seven, is just impossible. Um, one, of the, one of the things, really early things that, uh, that, I, that I teach most pain patients is, if your pain is a seven, why are you trying to have a conversation about a difficult topic with your spouse? <laughs> if your pain is a seven, it's time to go to a dark room for a while and rest. And if you can get your pain down to a four, you'll find that that conversation is much easier. Um, you're not going to get anywhere with difficult topics at seven. At eight, we begin to have other physical symptoms of pain that are secondary to the pain, like with the sweat that, that forms on the top of the lip or a little bit of nausea. At uh, nine, the pain is, is much more overwhelming. And at 10, we lose the sense that, there, that there's anything else in the world but pain. 10 is a level of pain that we really can't sustain for very long without losing consciousness. Um, so that's the grounded pain scale. Um, other words that, that we can use to talk about pain, other descriptors, I think it's, it's, it's helpful and it can be fun to play with words around pain. Pain can be described in colors, it can be described in textures, it can be described in shapes. Is it flat? Is it, is it round? Is it pointy? Is it dull? Is it achy? Is it sporadic? Is it urgent? That, um, I'll, I'll, playing with the language of pain. Talking about pain is really important, but when I ask people to talk about pain, um, 9 out of 10 say, I don't want to whine. So how do you talk about pain and not be a whiner? There are some rules. Use a low tone of voice. Avoid high pitches. Be matter of fact. Rule 2, keep to the anchored pain scale. Don't dramatic, dramatize or exaggerate. There is no 12 in pain. Most of the time, really, really most of the time, you're somewhere in the middle. Um, so keep to that grounded pain scale. Say thank you when people listen and respond appropriately. Um, use a paper and pencil to take notes on your pain, to write about your pain, even to journal about your pain. Pain is very, paper is very patient while we work out finding just the right words to pain. Writing it down also means we don't have to keep repeating the same thing over and over again. <laughs> Very quickly, you, if you're writing, you know write, you know really quickly when you're being repetitive. And your hand gets tired, so you stop repeating yourself. And it's there, it's captured. So writing is very useful. But um, pain diaries of, of recording uh, where your pain is at every hour or every day, um, do those with caution. Too much time and attention focused on just recording pain for pain diary can lead to pain escalation and it can distract us from other more joyful aspects of our life. So if you're asked to keep a pain diary or you think it's useful to keep a pain diary, by all means do if it's going to be helpful for diagnosis, but keep it to a short purpose and again use that, use that bound pain scale so that it's a quick, easy rate. Rate your pain in the moment. Don't try to give an average rating or to rate several days at once. Don't try to give a general rating of your pain because when we do that, we're much more prone to those 
biases of denial and, and panic. Stay in the moment. Step five, downsizing life. From a uh, review of the pain scale, you've noticed that, that stamina is a really big issue. Um, when we live with pain, we have less stamina, no doubt about it, and our life becomes more, more circumscribed, more small. Um, the story of the spoon people, this is a quick, quick fantasy story. Imagine a land where um, everyone wakes up in the morning to a pile of spoons. Um, uh, the, the average number of spoons in this land that people wake up to happens to be 100. No particular reason why it's 100, it just is. There are some people who, through the, the fortune of genetics or luck or something, wake up to 130 most days. Nobody really knows why, but they do. Others wake up to 70. Others wake up to 50. Um, so each person wakes up to their pile of spoons, and the pile of spoons is about the same, the same size every day. And the distribution of spoons isn't exactly fair. Um, now, in this land, every time you do something that requires energy, you lose a spoon. That's what spoons are for. So you get up, you get dressed, one spoon disappears. You take a shower, you should have done that before you got dressed, by the way, you lose another spoon. Uh, fix breakfast, there goes a spoon, right? If you drive to work, you lose a spoon or two. Um, uh, have, a, have a conversation with your wife, well, if it goes well, you might keep all your spoons. Uh, but if it goes, if it's difficult, you might lose a spoon even too, right? Same with your boss. Um, you get the idea. Every everything you do, you drop a kid off at school, you get a, you you uh, um, answer a phone call from their teacher, spoon, another spoon. When you run out of spoons, you have to go to bed. That's it. You're out of energy. No more spoons. So this is the way the spoon people live. It all works very well. Um, in a lot of ways, the spoon people are like us, but there's one way in which they're different. The spoon people know how many spoons they have, right? And the spoon people, they're very sensible. They know that not everybody gets the same pile of spoons, and so they don't make any silly assumptions about it. They're not saying to one another, well, why aren't you a 120 spoon person, you know? What's wrong with you? Or uh, if you just would exercise a little bit more, Serena, I'm sure your spoon pile would, would uh, increase to 120, like mine. You know, uh, they know that things like exercise and eating well can, you know, add a spoon or two, but they don't have unrealistic notions about it and they don't get all morally fixated about it, like spoons are a, a measure of your virtue. They know they're not. They know that spoons are just spoons. Hmm. Now, of course, you know that pain people are low spoon people. Some of us get 50 spoons a day. Some of us get 30 spoons a day. And our spoon budget stands in for uh, limited time, limited energy, limited money and income, and limited sensory input allowance. What do I mean by that? I mean, there's only so much noise and light and visual clutter and just sensory input I can handle in a day, right? Processing sensory input costs spoons. So life shrinks. Um, this might sound like bad news, but it's not necessarily bad news. Uh, lifestyle changes that come with pain, fewer commitments, less noise, fewer people, less clutter, certainly less money. But it's not a given that we'll have less joy. What we will have is a period of adjustment, a period of grieving, a period of changes. Um, and what we hope for is something like the experience that I got in discovering my backyard, which has hummingbirds and uh, snails and uh, the sound of a creek not far away. Um, this is another one of my favorite quotes forever. It's from William Blake, to see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower. We, hold, we do hold infinity in the palm of our hand. 
and the palm of our hand is is a whole world. Uh, if you can see it under a microscope, you'd know exactly what I mean. Um, we don't have to go out to find amazing things. You know, they say a square inch of soil has how many how many microorganisms in it? It's a whole world. It's a whole world. So think in miniature. Step six. Learning how pain works. At this part of the program, my job is to try to demystify pain. Um, there are people who know more about this than I do, uh, but I've learned through my reading and research that there are some important concepts that can help us understand pain as a communication system in the body and to make fewer mis have fewer misunderstandings about it. Pain is a neurological event. Um, there are two kinds of pain that we need to be aware of. Um, acute pain, which is usually pathogenic, and chronic pain, which is usually neurogenic. What do I mean by that? Pathogenic, well, think pathology. Pathology means something's wrong. You've got an illness or an injury. Acute pathogenic pain tells you, hey, you've got an illness or an injury. Pay attention. Slow down. Stop moving. Do something different, right? So acute pain is really important communication. It tells us what to do, and usually tells us what not to do, usually tells us to stop doing that, right? Stop right now, something's wrong, right? Pathogenic pain, usually but not always, is located where the problem is. That is, our brain usually but not always reads where pathogenic pain is coming from, right? Um, I always say pain is all in your head? Well, most of it's in your head. That is, it's mainly a brain event. It's the brain's job to make sense of pain, and the brain can get wrong the location of the pain, the intensity of the pain, and sometimes the brain can mistake kind of neurogenic noise for pain. Neurogenic pain is pain that originates in the nervous system itself. It's, it's let me say, it's, it's neurological noise. Um, Neurogenic pain becomes chronic, and it loses its um, it loses its usefulness as a as as communication about something wrong. Right. Um, uh, in my program, I'll talk more with when people take my program. I'll, I'll talk more about how nerve cells talk, uh, how the nervous system works. Uh, electrically and biochemically, how habituation and sensitization work in the nervous system. Um, habituation is when you uh, stop feeling something because it's not changing, like when you stop feeling the weight of your clothes on, on, your, on your arms. Sensitization is when the longer you feel something, the, the lower the threshold drops so that you actually feel it more and more strongly with time. Habituation is a more useful thing that the nervous system does because it allows us to notice changes and to ignore things that don't change, like the rings on my finger or my sweater. Right? Sensitization, um, is, uh, <laughs> sensitization is part of chronic pain conditions where over time uh, something um, we feel something more and more and more, even though it's not particularly useful information. So uh, for many of us, for instance, clothes um, are a source of pain. Uh, if you have a condition where part of your body has become sensitized and lost its ability to habituate, instead instead becomes sent more and more sensitive to the weight of clothes, then um, yeah, then as the day goes on, this occasionally happens to me, um, that that pain, that itch of my clothes gets worse and worse and worse, even though my clothes haven't changed. Um, neuroplasticity is kind of a longer term, uh, uh, a longer term phase of sen of sensitization. Over time, the principle of neuroplasticity is that the nervous system changes itself, and. Most of the time, we talk about neuroplasticity as a very helpful thing if we 
lose a few brain cells, we can grow another path around them because uh, nerve cells can grow and change and can uh, fill in for each other. Um, if we study the violin, we get better and better at it yeah, because the brain, the parts of the brain and the nervous system that are responsible for pitch perception and the coordination of the violin and so on get better. That's neuroplasticity. It's all about learning. With pain conditions, neuroplasticity isn't always our friend. Sometimes it means our nervous system is teaching itself to be a better and better and better perceiver of pain. Then we have a little bit of a problem and we have neuropathic pain taking hold. Inflammation affects pain. We'll talk more about that in the program and um, top down and bottom up processing of pain. Um, bottom up processes are those processes that where the communication goes from someplace in the body that is hurt to the brain and says, hey, pay attention, I'm hurting. Top down are things uh, that affect from the brain down uh, our perception of pain. So things like distraction, um, if, for instance, talking to you, I'm, I'm concentrating very hard and I'm fully involved in that. And um, I don't know, if, if, if the dog came and bit my toe, I might not notice a whole lot because top-down processes say, that's not what's important to pay attention to right now, Serena. Another thing that's happening top-down process for me right now is that my spouse is in the room. And when my spouse is in the room, if my spouse beams at me and smiles at me, whatever is hurting hurts much less. Um, on the other hand, if we're having a, a grumpy day or a fight, uh, in fact, what hurts hurts more. So uh, that's obviously not coming from my muscles. It's coming from, from top down. It's coming from something that's happening at the brain level. And so that's a top down process. Um, chronic pain, I look at as a d disability, not a disease, by the way. And I think that's a really important distinction. The bottom line uh, for learning about pain as a physiological experience is that it's not some mysterious metaphorical punishment from heaven. It's not this big deal. It's just a physiological event. It's complicated, but it's interesting. And we can make sense of it. And we can, we can make sense of it just mechanically and not so, be so intimidated by it. Step seven, developing your own pain management strategies. You may wonder what's taken me so long to get to this, the solutions to pain part of the program. There's a reason why I wait so long, and it's this. If people have not stood up to the shame and the stigma of pain, if people have not learned to say, to be proud, to walk tall, and to refuse to apologize, then that list of how to reduce pain becomes a list of ways to fail. That's very important to remember. So developing your pain management strategies comes further down the program. Here are some rules for approaching before we make the list. Rule one, no magical cures. Rule two, don't tell me what to do. I don't like to be told what to do. Tell me how this thing will work and let me decide whether or not to try it. And if I say, no, I don't think this will work for me, don't judge me. Rule three, what worked last week may not work today. So if it didn't work last week, you still might want to try it today, especially if it's cheap. A walk is cheap. Rule four, Change is usually incremental. It's a little bit at a time. So look for those small improvements and pay attention to them. Rule five, I am aware that with pain comes reduction in income. So make a budget. How much are you willing to spend on treatments, especially treatments that don't have a lot of research behind them or that you're not sure about? It's OK to say no. We need alternative medicines because mainstream medicine often lets us down, but it's largely an unregulated and kind of a buyer beware world. Um, so 
living with a budget, being able to tell your really, really nice acupuncturist that you've spent your budget this year, that's important. Uh, respect your budget. And rule six, the measure of success is beautiful moments. It's not the banishment of pain, it's beautiful moments. If you're having more of those, then you're on the right track. Here are, here's a list that, of things that a lot of people do find useful and that, that are well established as useful for most people um, and might be useful for you. So moderate exercise, especially if it's outdoors, especially if it's with good friends, and especially if it's in a beautiful place. Massage has, has a, good, a good background. Sensory breaks, that's one that a lot of people miss, getting out of the noise for a little while. Um, of course, keep a close eye on the basics, food, sleep, getting out of the house each day, Epsom salt baths. Meditation, uh, mindfulness meditation is, is particularly effective. Uh, prayer is just as effective if that's your thing. Um, uh, you don't have to do, uh, you know, form is not as important as, as doing it. Um, brushing the skin with a natural bristle brush is surprisingly effective for some people. I like that one myself. Stretching. Uh, learn a good stretch routine from a physiologist or an occupation therapist or your yoga teacher. Even a dance teacher uh, can give you good stretching routines. And uh, often getting really, really warm. Uh, helps to bring pain level down, especially if your pain originates in the muscles. So create, start making a list of your repertoire of things that are useful. And as you talk about your pain and your list with other people, that list will, will both grow and shrink. It'll grow as you add new things and it'll shrink as you drop things that you don't have time to keep trying. Um, step eight, Pay attention to what we love. Uh, now we're getting into the steps that, that are really important. Don't measure the importance of these by how long I talk about them. This is the heart of the program. This is what we've been bringing, building up to. The principle of neuroplasticity is that we strengthen the circuits that we use the most. So pay attention to things that give you joy and you will strengthen those circuits. Gratitude grows happy synapses in your nervous system. These are some of the, showed you some of the things that make me happy. They grow happy synapses for me. On the other hand, step side, on the other, or step nine is kind of on the other side. Beware the stories that we tell about our pain. Pain has a biography. It has a life story. What's the life story of your pain? How did it begin? How did it develop? What makes it better? How did you learn to live with it? What has it cost you? What has it given you? This is the biography of your pain. The story of your pain contains the emotional realities that you live when you live your pain, when you have flare-ups. And the moral of your story, whatever that is, is repeated every time your pain comes back, every time you have a flare-up. So if you have a story of your pain where the dominant theme is everybody abandons me, or nobody cares about me, or people misdiagnosed me because they didn't care, you know? If your the story of your pain is one of abuse or betrayal, then it's time to create a new story about your pain. I don't mean that you should deny that those things happened. That's not my point. But every story can be told many ways. A story about being abused is also a story about survival. A story about being abandoned is also a story about finding yourself, about looking inward. A story about being treated misdiagnosed is also a story about sticking to your truth. Right? So find the stories of your pain that highlight your own resilience, your courage, right? and the people and the things that help you get where you are today. 
Create a story about your pain that is a proud story. This is really important. Um, this isn't being a Pollyanna. It isn't, it isn't negating or, or dismissing your pain. It's finding the themes within that story that let you be proud. Because that is the story you live when your pain flares up. Step 10, now we are practicing a spirituality of pain. This is moving forward. Living in beauty, gratitude, compassion, and wonder. The beauty of life is measured in moments. This is, like I said, don't try to average your pain over time. Don't try to give a general rating of your pain. Pay attention to your pain in the moment. Give it just a rating of that moment. Well, joy is kind of like that too. Pay attention when it's there. And drink deeply of joy and beauty while it's there. You will never regret having paid close attention and, and really let it in. Right? Even, even a beautiful moment that is fleeting, even something that you know you can't hold on to, a sunset or a loved one, or a, a newborn baby that's going to grow into an ornery teenager. Um, savor those, savor the beauty of each of those things because when it does pass, what do you want to say? Do you want to say, oh, it was right here and I failed to, to take it in? Or do you want to say, man, that was sweet. I can still remember it. I can still, I can still feel you know, the, the touch of that skin, that, that baby's soft skin under my hand, or the, the way their hair felt. You know, I can still remember the, the sound of the creek and the salmon in the, in the creek swimming in the fall. That's what you want. Drink deeply and measure, count those moments. Gratitude. Appreciation is another word for increasing the value of something. It's not spelled the way I spelled it, by the way. Um, <laughs> appreciation spelled correctly is another word for increasing the value of something. Gratitude, appreciation deepens the experience. Compassion is the root of kind action. How do we grow compassion? By practice. Where do we practice? We practice where we are. If you're by yourself, practice on yourself. Practice every day. You know, practicing compassion on ourselves can be, you might wonder, why would I do that? You know, why would I be kind to myself? What does that give to the world? I'll tell you what it gives. It keeps our compassion skills sharp. It keeps us remembering how to speak kindly. Remember the thing about the otter. Talk to your body the way you would talk about that particular baby otter, right? Because when you can speak to yourself that way, as a habit, that habit generalizes out to the way you talk to other animals, the way you talk to plants, the way you talk to, to the world, the way you talk, you know, practice on, on characters in your favorite books or, or your favorite shows. Uh, uh, practice seeing people on the bus through compassionate eyes. Practice listening to funny accents and remembering that to somebody somewhere that's the language of their cradle. That's what love sounds like. As you practice seeing the world and compassionately this way, beginning with the world within and moving outward, it becomes such a habit that without even having to think about it, you start pra you, you're practicing it on your neighbors. And without even thinking about it, you realize one day that everyone feels like your neighbor. And wonder. Wonder has two words, or two meanings, sorry. Wonder has two meanings, curiosity and awe. So live in curiosity, live in awe. Be at home in your own awesomeness. And as I said that, I started to play with the words because I like to do that, and it came out, be, be, be at home in your own awesome nest. But before I got that typed, I mistyped it about eight times as mess, 
your own awesome mess, so I stopped arguing with it, left it on the PowerPoint, and said, yeah, be at home in your own awesome mess. It's okay. We're messy, but we're already whole. And that, my friends, is my last slide. So I'd like to open it up now to, um, to questions and, and comments. Um, thank you so much, uh, Serena. Um, at the moment, I think people, there's no questions that have been typed in here. So I think the information that you provided is just has been so wonderful that they're either taking some time to think about it or they may send in some questions afterwards. You're always welcome to send them into info at pipain.com and we'll make sure that they go to Dr. Patterson. Um, I also wanted to make sure that you notice down near the bottom of your control panel box there are those two handouts so if you've not clicked on them and downloaded them you're welcome to do that. And um, I want to thank everyone for, for joining in this wonderful uh, webinar today and especially thanks to you Dr. Patterson for so much uh, powerful information and suggestions of how we can make our adjustments to living with pain wisely and on purpose. And I hope everyone that joins us, it has not cost you too many spoons. Um, <laughs> again, thank you all so much. Thank you, Dr. Patterson. And please feel free to uh, send any questions in to us after you've had some time to, to think about this. It has been recorded, so it will be available for you to watch it again whenever uh, you have some time to do that. Um, thank Hello. you. Stay tuned for up-and-coming webinars. Yes. And be before before we sign out, I mean, and while we give people a little bit of time to maybe maybe type that question in, um, I, I want to return the thanks very much uh, for hosting me. Um, this has been a pleasure and and um, a courageous step on both our parts. I say this was <laughs> the first time I've given this talk, and uh, uh, it's it's a real honor to uh, to present here and and to be part of the the People in Pain Network. I think what what we're doing here is, and what you're doing here is, is really, um, it's an amazing step. It's you know opening opening conversations and and reaching out to one another. Um, I think this is going to change change the world. So I thank you so much for um, for having me here. Well, you are so welcome. I listening to all the things you said. Even though I've been ha living with pain for 26 years, I learned a whole lot, and um, and I'm sure all the listeners did as well. So, again, thank you very much, and um, send in your questions if you have any, and stay tuned for another webinar. We'll um, collaborate again and um, bring you some more such great stuff. Um, have a good uh, evening. I have a good weekend, everyone. Thank you again for joining us.